A report from a closed investor meeting claims Disney's Bob Iger wants to quiet the noise because culture war issues are not healthy for the company's business. Iger has made similar remarks before, but they of course reverberate differently now, with Disney's share price in the gutter. Dang it, Bob! Disney Plus in free fall. Virtually all of their movies either failing or failing spectacularly. And lest we forget, the loss of the Reedy Creek Development District. The irony is that most, maybe all of that, could have been avoided if Disney had quieted the noise a year and a half ago when Chapek wanted to do it, but he was blocked. And the ringleader behind that very well might have been Bob Iger. In this editorial, we will continue going through CNBC's explosive Disney expose, and this time, we'll explore Chapek's effort to make Disney politically neutral and the pushback against this. And here, we'll even add some extra details that CNBC left out, and finally, we'll explore the ramifications of not quieting the noise when they had the chance. For the earlier videos in this series, see our Disney and Bob Iger's mismanagement exposed playlist. But to summarize some highlights. When Iger appointed Chapek as his successor CEO, the deal was that Iger would still serve as the chairman of the board for another 22 months, enabling him to deal with all the content creation, celebrities, agents, and Hollywood glitz and glamour, while Chapek did all the boring day-to-day -day running of the company stuff. And you know what? Chapek did that really well. The biggest curveball was the Scarlett Johansson lawsuit, which, as we saw in the previous video, Chapek was blamed for even if it came from Iger's court and on Iger's watch. After the contracted 22 months were up, Bob Iger formally left his position as chairman of the board, where he was succeeded by Susan Arnold, a Chapek ally. This, however, did not mean that Disney was Chapex to run as he pleased. The company was still filled with Iger loyalists at all levels, whom, as it was later revealed, still deferred to Iger. The CNBC article reads, By this point, Chapex's inner circle had shrunk to a handful of senior executives. He didn't trust most of the existing leadership, largely because of their ties to Iger. Chapek did feel he had an ally in Arnold, who had become the new board chair according to people familiar with his thoughts. Arnold represented the post-Iger power center of Disney, and she was now also Chapek's boss. It wasn't long though, before she found herself in the center of a firestorm. Bob Iger had staffed Disney with ideopolitical activists at all levels, which increasingly had become apparent in both the parks as well as in Disney's programming. Today, Iger may claim that the culture wars is something Disney got dragged into against their will. But the reality is that, as Gary from Nerdrotic pointed out, Iger is a five-star general in it, and he even instigated the culture wars alongside his fellow revolutionaries. The revolution only became a war, if you will, when audiences and pundits alike started pushing back. Recognizing this, Chapek's explicit policy was taking Disney back to politically neutral, which he would do with Jeff Morrell, a former Pentagon press secretary serving under both Bush and Obama. Chapek appointed him as his chief of corporate affairs, who would handle both public and government relations. The article reads, Morell had outlined a new communication strategy to the board. Unlike what Iger had done before, he wanted Disney to stay out of political skirmishes entirely and instead signal its values through three Cs, content, culture, and community organizations supported by Disney. This did not sit well with the activists that Iger had staffed the company with. They just needed something, anything, to set them off and something came along.
The article continues. A little more than a month into JPEG's tenure without IGR at the company, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, a Republican, introduced the Parental Rights in Education Act, which critics called the Don't Say Gay Bill. The legislation would prohibit classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity. That's not entirely accurate, so here CNBC kind of drops the ball. I have explained what this bill is actually about before, so let's briefly revisit my editorial from the time when this was going on. While the bill does place restrictions on sexual instruction, it is fundamentally about transparency. Meaning, parents have to be informed about what their children ages 5 to 9 are being taught. For purely politically partisan purposes, this bill has been given another nickname in the establishment news channels. While this nickname is a wild misrepresentation of what the bill actually is about, it does serve to drive the activists into a frenzy. Someone who actively contributed towards driving the activists to a frenzy, especially those working within Disney, was Bob Iger. The article reads, Iger tweeted his thoughts. If passed, this bill will put vulnerable young LGBTQ people in jeopardy, he wrote. During Iger's tenure as CEO and chairman, he had freely pontificated about an array of causes, including climate change, diversity, and abortion. In a series of virtual meetings after the killing of George Floyd, Iger had told Disney employees that making their voices heard was the best way to bring about change, according to people on the calls. In other words, Iger had staffed Disney with activists and always encouraged them to be activists. His tweet did the same thing now, even if JPEG wanted to take Disney in a different direction. The article continues. JPEG and Morel had assumed they'd have months to explain their strategy internally, but Iger's tweet dialed up the pressure on JPEG to say something. On March 7th of 2022, Chepek and Morel put their new public relations strategy into action. They penned a memo to all staff, approved by the board. It explained that the company would not take a public stance on the bill. In the memo to staff, Chepek wrote, Corporate statements do very little to change outcomes or minds. Instead, they're often weaponized by one side or the other to further divide and inflame as we are about to see was done with this very statement. Simply put, they can be counterproductive and undermine more effective ways to achieve change. The blowback was swift. Employees chastised JPEG with hashtags such as hashtag Disney do better and hashtag Disney say gay. But JPEG and Morel were convinced that this was the right thing for the company. They didn't want Disney in a culture war with DeSantis, with whom JPEG had a solid relationship at the time. But chairman Susan Arnold told JPEG that she'd been bombarded with furious comments from the LGBTQ community and sensed Disney's brand was at risk. JPEG would have to walk back the statement for the good of the company, she said. Red-faced with anger, Chapek laid into his communications team, telling them he regretted putting out the statement if the board refused to back him, according to people familiar with the matter. But Chapek was hardly operating from a position of strength. He didn't yet have an extension to his contract, which was set to expire in February of 2023. Thumbing his nose at Arnold would hardly be wise. Chapek scrambled for a new public response. He walked back his statement at Disney's annual meeting, which happened to be just two days later. I understand our original approach, no matter how well intended, didn't quite get the job done, Chapek said. But we're committed to support the community going forward. Still unsatisfied, Susan Arnold told Chapek he needed to formally apologize, specifically to Disney employees. You needed me to be a stronger ally in the fight for equal rights, and I let you down. Chapek wrote in a March 11 statement to employees that they penned together. I am sorry. This, then, was the basis for the famous hostage video of Chapek. CNBC did a great job in bringing this information to the public. 
but they did drop the ball in one regard. It wasn't just that the activist low-level employees were sending nasty tweets. Oh no, it took way more than that to freak out Arnold and the board to the point that JPEG was forced to apologize. CNBC left this out, but what happened was that the low-level employees were led by a highly organized movement within Disney called the Disney Walkout Movement. In no time flat, they had created the public webpage whereisjpeg.com. They were very visible in social media, and the statements from this group were of such a legalese and corporate nature that the people behind it could only have come from Disney's most senior ranks. Let's revisit our reporting from the time. The highly organized Disney walkout group came out of the dark and presented their list of demands, both in terms of how Disney is to be run, the messaging in Disney products, as well as organizations and interest groups to fund and politicians not to fund. It reads very much like a hostage letter, and to show they meant business, they were calling for thousands upon thousands of Disney employees to walk out and take to the streets, both in Disney's LA and Florida locations, and this was after Chapek had already largely bent the knee, but that wasn't enough. The Disney walkout group demanded more and proceeded with the walkouts. As it turned out, one employee walked out in Florida. About 60 to 70 LA employees walked out in LA. This included the Kathleen Kennedy faction of Lucasfilm, which proudly took a selfie and tweeted, Lucasfilm walkout. Time to watch The Last Jedi again because this is a movement of leaders. Anyone can be powerful. No one owns the labor force besides ourselves. Also held was an internal town hall meeting where all of the activists within Disney could talk about their agenda, proudly brag about the messaging they put into Disney products, and how their goal is that there should be, at the very least, 50% representation in all of Disney's output, and more in that vein. Even a hostage video of Bob Chapek himself was published, in which he kowtows completely to the activists, promising that he will be a better ally. Again, all of this is done to appease the activists within Disney in a closed meeting that no one else was invited to witness or attend. We know all of this because shortly afterwards, the most extreme highlights from this event, the clips that would gather the most backlash, were strategically leaked to the public. And predictably, the backlash came. Before we get to that backlash, let's go back to the CNBC article, because Iger was about to rub salt into the wounds. In a late March interview with CNN's Chris Wallace, Iger had some veiled words for JPEG. When you're dealing with right and wrong, or when you're dealing with something that does have a profound effect on your business, then I think you just have to do what is right and not worry about the potential backlash to it, Iger said. Clearly, Iger thought he was on the right side of history, and his view was that Disney should have used their economic might to interfere in Florida politics right away, and not only after internal pressure. Opposing this bill, according to Iger, was right. Was it though? That is debatable, but at the time, Iger was clearly on the right side of the balance of power. The CNBC expose even makes the point that this whole ordeal had weakened Chapek significantly because of the beating he took in the media, while Iger's own mistakes were covered up. Here, they cite an example of Iger making a racist joke at the expense of a black employee, something Chapek never did, and something which would have caused any other CEO to have to resign. But Iger's level of power was such that this was never leaked to the press, or if it was, the story was never followed up on. But while the Disney walkout movement may have won a PR victory over JPEG, it came at a hefty price. The videos leaked from that town hall revealed to the world that Disney's not-so-secret agenda wasn't something you imagined. It wasn't anyone seeing ghosts. It was very, very real. Our leadership over there has been so welcoming to, like, my, like, not-at-all-secret gay agenda. Like, I was just, wherever I could, just basically adding queerness. 
This combined with the quality of the activist produced Disney content, or rather lack thereof, caused millions and millions of people around the world to think twice about watching Disney content and about going to Disney's parks, something they are feeling the brunt of right now. Also, Chapek being forced to interfere in Florida politics and the revelations of what was really going on at Disney caused Florida Governor Ron DeSantis to dissolve the Reedy Creek Development District only weeks later. I guarantee you, no one in Team Iger's walkout movement had planned on or saw that coming, because the loss of those special privileges that no one else has will cost Disney billions, and on a long enough timescale, trillions. Here it should be noted though that that didn't happen overnight. No, dissolving the Reedy Creek District was a two-stage process. The proverbial nuclear codes, if you will, on Reedy Creek were entered while Chapek was CEO. But remember, he and DeSantis had a good working relationship. Continuing the analogy that the codes have been entered only means the button can be pushed, not that it must be pushed. Had Chapek continued on, it is not outside the realm of possibility that he would have reached some kind of compromise deal with Florida that would have allowed both Disney and DeSantis to save face. We will never know, because instead, Bob Iger returned as CEO, and being a hyper-partisan Democrat, his tone towards the Republican DeSantis, even in the press, was always accusatory and inflammatory. Under those conditions, no mutually beneficial deal with Florida could be reached, as that would have caused DeSantis to lose face. Maybe it would have happened anyway, but the proverbial red nuclear button on Reedy Creek was pushed only after Iger returned as Disney CEO. If Bob Chapek had stayed on and been allowed to take Disney back to politically neutral a year and a half ago like he wanted, then who knows where Disney would have been today. No embarrassing clips would have leaked, because they would never have been filmed in the first place. The movies would have dropped the agenda by now, and for all we know, Reedy Creek might still have been there. I don't know if Iger is serious about wanting to quiet the noise now, although I sincerely hope he is. If he is, that would fall into the better late than never category, but in many ways the damage has already been done. Undoing it is no longer possible. Now the question is, can the damage be mitigated? That question I leave for you to answer in the comments. Before you do, smash that like, subscribe, and indicate you want notifications on all videos. For more videos like this, check out our Disney playlist, and if you want something completely different, we have that too. Up to and including an exclusive and highly suppressed interview with none other than Graham Hancock himself. Check it out.